first of all, like to explain what I mean by a wicked problem. Um, there are quite a few definitions out there, and I'm delighted to see that the Australian government has actually published a paper on how to manage wicked problems. I've mentioned this to a number of Australian colleagues. They hadn't discovered it, but I had, the joys of the World Wide Web. Um, so I'll explain a bit in a moment about that. I'll have a whistle-stop tour around some of the characteristics of UK infrastructure and what some of the current issues and problems are. Just to put in perspective what I then say, which uh, about approaches to their resolution, which hopefully will have more resonance uh, with you and with us. Um, of course, we are a much smaller country. We have a very different uh, history and situation. So those first two bullets will cover our situation, just to base what, why we're doing what we're doing. But I think the approaches to their resolution, what the research activities are that then follow, uh, and thoughts for the future um, will be more uh, a stimulus for the rest of the day and some debate. So first of all, wicked problems. First of all, the, one of the features of a wicked problem is that it's not understood until after you've started formulating the solution. And it goes back to a comment that a number of speakers have already made, that if you then charge into the solution earring, in other words, actually executing the solution too quickly before you've got a real understanding you will distort the nature of, of your outcome of, of trying to solve whatever issue it is, and probably that's not the right place to be. So that, uh, that element of dealing with a wicked problem is to iterate around thinking about what solutions might be possible and then really seeing if they do meet what you would regard as being the problem. And Because if it doesn't, then you should keep on going around in circles. It's called front-loading a program. Um, and most of you who have experience of large programs, as I do, know that is exactly what you should do, but you don't quite articulate it normally in this way. Secondly, wicked problems have no stopping rule. Quite often we try and shoehorn wicked problems into being projects or programs, and they almost by definition have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But infrastructure issues are continuous. We live with them for such a long time that you really can't elaborate them as programs or projects. So, and, and that's the technical phrase, a stopping rule is a project has a well-defined beginning, middle, and end. And if you try and shoehorn that activity into that, it's really difficult. Of course, that is very much counterfactual to investment, return on investment, uh, political cycles, all the other heartbeat issues that I've, uh, we've heard about already, at least some of them. Um, so wicked problems don't really be, can't really be shoehorned into that metaphor either and that makes it doubly difficult for them to be dealt with. Maybe that's why we're calling them wicked problems. They're not right or wrong either, which means if you try and define what it is you want as an outcome, which competition for procurement tends to force you towards, you'll end up with making a decision which you regard as being right or wrong, ab initio, when in fact you need to collaborate towards a solution which uh, is acceptable to a wide range of stakeholders. And that is why I believe, and I'll give you some evidence later, that the m mixture of competition and collaboration, and I'm not saying we know how to do this yet, is the right um, way of thinking about going, uh, of dealing with wicked problems. Everyone is new. We've never done quite a lot of what we're now attempting to do when we go into a large infrastructure capability uh, uh, development. So because it's novel and unique, it's quite difficult to learn from experience because we haven't got it. Um, and that means we need to learn by doing as we progress, having defined what it is we're, we're understanding we need to do, very much more diligently than we might otherwise do. Now, it's not quite true to say that, of course, but I'll give you some examples of where, um, uh, later on, of where these things can be um, got drastically wrong. Quite a lot of large-scale infrastructure wicked problems you get one go at. And because you've got to get it right first time, especially if it is transforming a major landscape, um, it's really important that we understand how that, how that works. One of the reasons I'm here today is because Gary and I have a mutual friend called John Armit. And John Armit is the uh, chief executive, uh, sorry, the chairman of the Olympic Delivery Authority in London. So he's had the responsibility of delivering the infrastructure that supports the Olympic Games for 2012. And if that isn't a one-shot operation, what is? And in talking to him about that, he has actually discovered that it was actually one of the easiest projects he's ever done. He was in charge of our railways before that. <laughs> and why it was easy was he knew when it was going to be finished. He knew pretty well what the budget was. 
plus or minus half a billion, and it's about a 10 billion program, a third of the Chinese budget. We're quite proud of that. And it's finished a year early. He, he will hand it over to the operators in July this year, July 2011, and the games start in July 2012. The tickets are on sale, by the way, um, if anyone wants to come. Um, so it's a one shot, and that is a really good example. And we're using in our studies, which I'll refer to later, of case studies, to that activity to try and e extract the principles of how he got that right, because those are usable in lots of other domains which won't have the similar constraints of knowing when it'll finish and knowing what the budget is, but nevertheless, it is a one shot. And the wicked problems also have no alternative solutions quite often. There really is only one way of thinking about dealing with, with the issue. What I found very interesting in working with Gary this week uh, and reading around what the ambition was before I got here was that the agenda for the smart facility maps onto this extremely well. And that was a really um, good outcome as far as I was concerned in coming over here. So moving on then from wicked problems, which sort of defines my philosophy around how uh, I've been working in this space. And, and it's about a two and a half year journey for me so far in trying to understand the philosophy as opposed to having been a practitioner and, and, a, and a more of a theorist. I've tried to get my hands around the philosophy, which is not the same thing. Um, what are, What is the nature of good infrastructure? Do we actually know what we want out of good infrastructure? And I'll just go through one or two things that I think are relevant, partly to frame what I then say about the situation we're finding ourselves in the United Kingdom, but also to frame some of the debate later. So I'm going to pick on these five elements of infrastructure, energy, transport, water, waste, and information, as being the things that move stuff around. And because of that, they sort of interact with each other. In fact, they're interdependent in lots of complicated ways. And waste, for us, which is the one that previous speakers haven't really quite touched on, is we think quite important because as consumers, both in industrially and domestically, we produce a huge amount by consumption. And as a result of that, if we don't recycle that in a sensible way, um, then it isn't part of our transport, it, it isn't part of our infrastructure or system uh, efficiency model. And that's why I've included waste. It's shared, and it's shared at a range of scales. And although I've put at a national and a regional scale, of course, a lot of it is shared at an international scale. We still, unfortunately, ship quite a lot of our waste to other parts of the world for landfill. We're not very proud of that. In fact, we're moving very fast to try and avoid doing that. But economically, if you only looked at the economy, and of course, that's what a lot of private companies who are responsible for waste management will look at, and that's their legal obligation to their shareholders, they'll ship it to some part of the world which is the cheapest place to dump it. And unless they're regulated from some reason for not doing so, that is it is what they'll do. Now, that's not a very clever way of producing a sustainable planet. So looking at infrastructure at a national and regional scale is, is particularly important. It's also got to be of, a, whoops, ooh, finger trouble, of sufficient quality to support a developed society. Now, we all think we live in a developed society, and there are other parts of the world where they know they don't. And we are all obviously trying to help them get to a position which we think is the right place to be a developed society. In digging around in the literature, the academic literature and elsewhere, to see what I could find to provide some sort of definition of what a developed society was, I fell on something of a blank, which is interesting in itself, because it does mean we probably haven't examined how important in infrastructure and other facilities would be for helping establish and support and maintain a developed society. So we don't really know what a sufficient quality is, and that's a piece of research that I think is very valuably uh, uh, investigated, both inside countries where cultures affect those issues, but also internationally, because the, there will be common features, there will be differences, and understanding those differences is, is particularly important. We know from recent events that we have to have infrastructure that's more resilient to shock of all sorts, natural and man-made shock, and systemic shock, things we didn't design properly, or in inbuilt systems failures that unfortunately happen. And also to make sure that it's well managed and well governed. And very importantly, that it attracts continuous investment. And I'm gonna dwell slightly on what I mean by investment, because most of you would immediately react and say, yeah, that's money. It means it's got to attract continuous investment of money. Well, of course it has but it's also got to attract continuous investment of other sorts of capital, in particular intellectual capital, 
And as Nick said, it's something that we've probably neglected. We have, and I, he, he, I'm not going to be brave enough to say whether you have or not, but I'm reflecting back Nick's words, that most developed countries actually have, over the last 30 or 40 years, neglected the intellectual input into thinking about infrastructure. The natural resources that are then needed for the different paradigm that we're now living in of, of six pushing nine billion people on the planet may well cause us to think about how we invest the natural resources we've got in infrastructure in a different way, whether it's for climate change or reasons or for anything else. And perhaps most importantly, the political capital. And I'm echoing Nick very much in saying this, that why should the need for having a developed infrastructure to support a developed society not be an apolitical issue? Where is the political debate that draws a divide between why should we do it and how should we do it in a way where how is a more political issue, but why we should is not. And I think we need, and maybe smart in this country and certainly in, in the UK, we're trying to promote that uh, discourse in a, in a sensible and non-confrontational way. <laughs>